Licht an. Oh, da hinten hebt ein Flieger ab. Awesome. Wie awesome ist das denn? Hello there. In this video I'll be showing you the Omegon LX4 Mechanical Tracker. We'll have a look at its functions, how to set it up and use it and whether you should get one yourself. But first, why should anyone need such a tracker? Have you thought about taking your Astro Gear with you during a holiday trip? Or here outside on the field? As I went to the beautiful island La Palma this summer, I needed some sort of small tracker to help me take longer exposures of the Milky Way for landscape Astro. Typically for widefield full frame Milky Way shots, you'd normally follow the 500 rule. You divide 500 by your focal length and obtain your max exposure time until the stars start trailing. With a properly set up tracker, you can extend this time from a mere 10, 20 seconds to a few minutes, much more integration time. So here I was, having decent telescope mounts, but nothing really compatible with traveling, at least traveling light. That's why I got me this mechanical tracker, the Alex 4. I had these trackers on my watch list for a longer time now, but with my La Palma trip planned, I had a good reason to actually purchase one myself. My thoughts on it, its advantages and flaws, and whether I'd purchase it again, all in this video. Coming up. The Omegon LX4, or Quattro, is, as the name suggests, the fourth iteration of a series of mobile barn door trackers. That's at least the closest gear category on telescopias <laughs> I could find. The first device and principle was initially designed by a name twin of mine, Christian Fatinanzi, in Italy. Now with the Sesto Senso Due and the LX Quattro, I actually got quite some Italian products in my Astro gear. Mamma mia! <laughs> the commercial product was finalized and is currently sold by Astro Shop's own brand, Omegon. Next, I want to tell you some things about the design, which make this tracker stand out in comparison to other lightweight battery-driven trackers. <sighs> it's nice out here. As you can see in this footage, the tracker uses no counterweight shaft or any of that, but balances the payload via a spring-loaded system, meaning no counterweight is needed, only your camera on top working against the spring-loaded mechanism. You tension the spring and the device works automatically without electrical power. On the back, behind the RA axis and below the ball head, you have the possibility to adjust the spring tension, depending on the weight and camera orientation of the setup. The OEM, Omegon, states that this device can carry up to 4 kilograms of payload with this fourth iteration. More on that in the My Thoughts section later. On the right hand side, you can find the pole finder scope, which is now in a different position compared to previous versions, meaning your mounted camera is no longer in the way of the polar scope during setup. On the bottom of the tracker, the actual wind-up mechanism can be found, which gives you tracking for about an hour, roughly. Your leftover time is displayed by small dots on the metal, divided into 10-minute sections. When the timer runs out, similar to an egg timer in your kitchen, a little bell will ring, indicating that you need to wind it up once again. The default configuration is set up for the northern hemisphere, but there is an adapter in the box for a setup for the southern hemisphere too. The ball head for the camera can be mounted with a 3 8 inch screw, which is pretty common for ball heads, and the bottom of the tracker itself can either be connected to a tripod with a 1 4 inch, 3 8 inch or a Vixen GP mount. Let's continue with a sample session as a demonstration of the setup and usage. This will take place at home. Hi there! Welcome to the quick demonstration here inside my room. And let's just pretend I'm out on the field like I'm in the previous section and set up my Omegon LX4 tracker. Let's just imagine I got here with my photography backpack and I got my tripod here. And I'm just gonna set it up now. Really easy and really basic to show you how the tracker is being used. Let's say 
I put it in my tripod like this, want it close to the ground. Then this is like the base. Then we have our backpack. And we also got our tracker here with me or with us. We need to remove the pump finder before. There we go. And let's stabilize it first by adding the backpack here at the bottom. Okay, it's not really doing much here in this case, but let's imagine it would be higher. Then of course we also have our diesel R or diesel M with us. In this case, just put it here for demonstration purposes. And now we got our tracker. So um, our tracker, as I explained, um, we already have the um, Vixen mount attached to the bottom here. So it's missing from this ball head of the tripod and I have it um, here on the back. Um, as we could see, this is the ball head where the camera will uh, fit onto. This one. Let's put the pole finder in first. We can do that by inserting it from this side and looking here to the northern celestial pole like this. So we start by disengaging here the clutches. I think I need to turn it around though. Yeah, like this. Mount the Weixen rail like that and we're almost done. Now I can roughly adjust my ball head here at the bottom and I would say it's easier to view uh, once we're finished from this side but I will turn it around real quick to demonstrate you how you would then align it first. And here, of course, on this side, our diesel M will go. So I would remove the, this part here first, and then we can set up with set it up here at the top, like this, for example. Now, I've already, if you imagine, the north and celestial pole goes in this direction. Then the camera would be pointing towards the south, which on the northern hemisphere normally would be the Milky Way, especially when during the summer months. <clears throat> Let's open that. It is still, um, if you have a big camera or a big uh, lens on there, then maybe you sometimes need to shift the camera a bit in order to use the pole finder. So as a next step, before we can start, we need to adjust and find the northern celestial pole. We can do this by utilizing here the pole finder. And as I said, and I will be saying that again in our talk about advantages and disadvantages, that with a ball head it's a bit more tricky. It's not impossible, of course, no. Um, and it's, it's also doable, but it's a bit more tricky than with a wedge. But it's cheaper that way, actually. So then I, let's imagine I just Turn it a bit, adjust it, and that's it. And then let's say we're done in terms of pole alignment. Then for demonstration purposes I will turn it around so you can see it better. Let's say this would be then pole aligned. Then as a next step I will start the timer here. You can hear it ticking. Now we have one hour of time to follow um, our night target. I would adjust my camera in a way where my target would be. Let me adjust the screen a bit so I can see it better. Do a few test shots and if I'm happy then I would uh, go and check for the correct BPM setting of the ticking noise. In a pre-recorded video, I showed the um, simple Android tool, BPM counter. It's just a very basic Android tool from a rather and older uh, Android <laughs> standpoint. A gingerbread or something, I don't know, but it's uh, fairly old, but still working quite fine, the app. Um, you can just tap on it and um, then it counts the BPM, so how many taps per minute. 
And with this tracker you need to aim for 135 BPM, then it would follow the sidereal rate of the earth quite well. Um, you can adjust it by the um, spring adjustment, the tension adjustment on the back. I will rotate that real quickly here too. And maybe I can give, give you a close up on that. Let's see if I can manage to do that. All right, so um, you can here see the spring tension. It's set to a certain point and quite easily, if I move it in that direction, then either the ticking will get faster or it will get slower. Now I increased it, you can hear it. And the idea is to match it to the 135 BPM. Let's lower it once again. Go lower even than that. Yeah, it gets a bit more silent. All right, so I will put you back now. I'm sticking. We are shooting our images. I have the camera on. Hopefully I either use the interval setting of the camera, which for this case in Sony only goes up to 30 seconds max time um, but with an intervalometer we could um, connect it and then shoot our Milky Way images maybe even with higher focal lengths even some um, bigger nebulas and Royal Galaxy yeah we could go for it now in my intro sequence I was out on the field and not only I did uh, record the intro luckily uh, the sky was even clear and I tried it out uh, for demonstration purposes with different durations, but we'll let Chris on the field explain. Chris on the field, tell us about your session on the field. And let's start the session. Hi, I'm back, uh, still outside here. Initially, I did not intend to actually um, go for a shooting session. I hoped that uh, Routes, clouds would not start to turn into rain clouds but apparently the sky is clear for a few hours so I decided I will take some shots you can hear it ticking um, I wanted to do a little comparison also because initially in the script I had no um, values to compare higher exposure durations and I checked the trailing but now I took one minute, two minute and four minute exposures I tried to go with a very low ISO, I think uh, 50 here on the Sony and uh, just taking some test shots but now I'm also taking a little um, session um, I think two minute exposures but yeah the post production will <laughs> show it on the screen I think uh, when, when showing you the images I think I will do a little comparison um, on the star trailing and um, the performance uh, but at home then later. But it's, it's actually really fun. I, I enjoy this um, very much. Uh, it's just this little tracker, your camera and a tripod and you're good to go. And of course a, a remote shutter. But you need that anyway. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really hyped. It's always nice to be out. Especially I'm out here on a hill. I can see every direction I even saw a meteor and that was really really something uh, great again yeah um, getting back the energy <sighs> some exhaust exhaustive weeks uh, prior and feels good to be out in the field again <laughs> okay next step somewhere else I think I said that in La Palma too but uh, next step back to the studio Hi guys, I'm now back in the studio and we can have a look at the images that I've taken with the tracker and the Alpha 7 with the Sigma 20mm 1.4 DG DN and I've opened up Capture One here um, with a nice little image but we want to scroll here. I've taken uh, some comparison shots, three of them to be precise 
And initially I also intended, you can see here, uh, to take longer two minute exposures to actually stack some thing. But as you can see here, um, the lens was yeah, collecting water. It got foggy, so not really the best conditions and I did not bring my uh, lens heater. So nothing to, to combat this issue. But I've taken three images before, which I want to show you to compare the tracking accuracy, if you want to call it. Uh, please bear in mind that it all depends on a precise polar alignment. So I could definitely have improved that. Um, I just did a quick polar line. I did not even check a pole finder app to match the hour angle. I just roughly polar aligned it, but it should not be too bad as um, we're dealing with a 20 millimeter object, uh, 20 millimeter lens on a full frame lens sensor. So you have a really big field of view. So any deviations should not be too much visible. But um, to give you a, a real comparison, um, I intend to stretch the images a bit just to um, show them, um, show you the stars a bit better. But we want to start, I think, with this one. I did mess up a bit because I had a self timer and the camera enabled while um, shooting with the intervalometer. So uh, it's not exactly one minute, but 55 seconds. And then we have two minutes and four minutes. So um, with the, um, oh, I'm seeing that here I did use F1.8 and F1.4 and the other ones. Yeah, we have to just keep that in mind. ISO 100 here for the lowest one and I went into the um, low ISOs on the Alpha 7 here even up down to 50 for the um, long ones just to not overexpose the bright areas. Uh, oftentimes I encountered that it um, yeah by shooting Milky Way especially not too far, far from home um, it gets bright rather quickly. So I want to apply a little stretch here to the first one and then I would just copy this same editing over to the other ones. So we increase the Belichtung here, which is the exposure, just until we can see something. And then we can dial back the blacks a bit. Uh, like this maybe. It's not pixel inside, of course, but um, for a quick comparison, I think it's quite quite nice. So here we have the um, 55 seconds and I want to get also into the corners. Okay. Here we have this one, then um, I would just copy it over the same edit and over to this one too. Okay. It's as I said, it's quite bright already. Maybe we have to dial down a bit here um, again. But um, let's look at them in comparison. We have these three and I'm not sure if I have the possibility to go through them that easily, but I will just go through them just after each other. Okay, so um, if we want to go a bit closer here, um, I think for the shortest exposure, um, there's some slight trailing visible, which could be still um, because the mount was maybe also wobbling. Because it's interesting for the shortest one, um, I don't recall it for the longer ones. <clears throat> Here you can see a bit elongations in the stars, but overall the Milky Way shape, I think it's quite fairly visible. No big issues, I would say. Um, I don't think you get troubles uh, for the stacking. Then let's head over to the two minute exposure, which is already getting quite bright. Um, let's get also to the corners and keep in mind that the um, Sigma lens actually has quite some good performance um, in the corners as well, even on F1.4. And okay, we can see here a bit of this issue, but I'm not sure whether that's a lens artifact because um, here in the, in the center I don't see like a big star trailing. Um, I, I know from my telescope <laughs> uh, when the guiding is off or something. So um, overall 
I think here uh, for the Milky Way um, overall shape and for the trailing it's it's quite well. Of course um, the, the, the stretched way here is not not looking that well but <laughs> we're just here for the optical comparison. Then this one I think I should dial down this a bit um, and let's dial this a bit down because it's too bright. this I think that's fairly usable so here we have and this is already I would say on the more extreme side um, where you can use this tracker but um, it was four minutes here we can see some slight trailing um, which of course I, I would argue is because of my uh, rather quick pole alignment I did not spend too much time I just um, tried to find Polaris um, even the Pole finder though, but not uh, as I said in the hour angle, the correct hour angle, so that may be a reason here. But um, I think this is astigmatism, if I'm not. Uh, so actually, I think this is some, art this, these are artifacts from the lens actually. So let's rather check uh, somewhere in the middle and here uh, where you can see the Milky Way, we do not see trailing stars. Uh, that much. So I would argue um, that it's actually quite, it's, it's doing quite well uh, in terms of uh, performance. If you think about it, um, I'm close to the edge of, I would say, what is possible with the mount and with the tracker because I used this, oops, this big full frame <laughs> camera and also not with the, it's not a lightweight thing. The 20 millimeter lens. So, um, well, what's the weight? Hard to tell. Maybe 1.5 kilograms, I would say. So, um, yeah, you definitely can use uh, full frame lenses on there. It's it's uh, <laughs> not a showstopper. And actually, I'm quite impressed by the performance here. So um, on La Palma, I even had more time and uh, I wanted to be a bit more uh, precise with the polar alignment even though it was a different latitude <laughs> uh, was not used uh, to the angle but um, I can show you some images from this where I stacked them but overall the optical performance uh, from the tracker the, the guiding perform oh, the guiding the tracking performance I'm I'm really happy with it and yeah let's continue now, what are my thoughts on this little piece of equipment? First, I should clarify that A, this video is not sponsored in any way, and B, that I'm using the cheapest model of the Quattro LX4, i.e. the version without a ball head and a wedge. I added a ball head from my own collection to put on the tracker and put the system directly onto a tripod with another ball head. The no wedge thing made things a little bit more complicated, but we'll get to that point in more detail uh, just in a few more minutes. For the pros and cons, I've created notes, which I'd like to address now back at home. While we're at it, um, I've taken a little uh, pros and cons list and why not head over and just check it out. Okay, so um, I got my little pro and con list here. And I think um, we'll just start and I will bring it up for that. So, <clears throat> here we have it again. So, um, let's start with the disadvantages. Uh, I think that makes sense. So, um, the first thing I have on my list is the ringing noise. Not the ticking, but the... Uh, okay. Uh, the ringing noise. And theoretically, if you're imaging in your backyard, uh, it could be <laughs> that your neighbors are out and you don't want to yeah, throw out the big noise here, have it ringing in the night. Maybe you have a big yard and it's no problem. And uh, maybe you're out on the field, but for situations where you have a, like a little yard, a little backyard and yeah, you don't want to mess with your neighbors, then <laughs> this could be a disadvantage. Uh, I for certain, mm, well, I, I think about it and I, I want to be out uh, before it rings in order to, well, 
give it more power to, to uh, pull it once again. Um, but I don't think it's too loud and uh, there are cars passing by and, and stuff that's also loud so I don't think the ringing is too, too much of an issue. And I've read on a website that it's also possible to remove one little metal plate and then it won't ring. Um, so if you really hate it then <laughs> you can disable it too. Um, then one other thing, the um, mounting of the RA axis here, the ball head, can be a bit tricky because um, of course this axis um, will turn once uh, you pull it out because it's a tracked axis of course and when you mount it of course you, you're working against the axis so I would suggest to not um, remove it that often so um, when you when you buy this mount without a ball head and you buy, buy a ball head separately yeah, expect the ball head to be um, always connected to this, or at least I would advise it and not to use the ball head on another tripod or something, but use it directly on this mount for, for its complete purpose, because I think it, you can damage the um, mounting system. I think you can screw it in so it's fixed, but it's a bit more annoying and I would leave the ball head on there always. Um, the third thing is, um, disadvantage, if you are imaging and it's a disadvantageous position and I'm not really sure um, which positions are uh, that, but sometimes it can happen that if you are somewhere in the middle and you're imaging, then sometimes the ticking stops and I have the feeling that then the tracking is not in its um, sidereal rate, it's a bit slower or something. You, you need to be aware that there can be some tricky balancing situations where the tracking might not be um, at its full 100%. So, but if you if you are imaging more often with it, you get to know these positions and uh, of course if you stay with the camera then um, you hear it uh, anyway. But uh, Especially in La Palma, for example, I did not encounter it. Most of the time I did, um, when I saw it, it was in my backyard for some reason, I don't know why. Right, um, but it's also not, not a showstopper. It's just, you have to be aware um, at certain angles, maybe double check it and uh, maybe give it a, another push to <laughs> increase the energy once again and then um, it, it's back to normal. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, um, the four kilograms payload max capacity. I've read an online um, review or an online comment that someone wanted to put a red cat on there with a diesel R and that was too big. And even though it was below four kilograms, apparently um, the, <laughs> the tracker was not performing too well and the uh, author or the, the site, I think they've responded and said that, well, you have to wait uh, to be close to the uh, to the axis actually so you cannot mount a big telescope with weight very far away from the um, tracking axis so if you have this um, diesel R here or the diesel M I mean here it has a rather compact center of gravity I would say not too much weight away from it so that um, works well and the last uh, disadvantage or negative point would be um, yeah of course you cannot add a guide camera <laughs> to this mount so if you want to do landscape astro or um, low focal length stuff with a guide camera um, for tracking arrows that's not the way to go of course it's a mechanical tracker it does not have a, a guiding pulse input okay that's too much uh, that's so much of the um, disadvantages now let's get back to the more positive side and check out what I really enjoyed about this tracker and like about it. Um, so the first point is um, it's actually fun to use. So um, with all equipment it's always, um, it can be really pricey, it can be really expensive, but um, <laughs> if you don't use it, uh, it's not worth that much I would say. And this one, it's always fun to throw in your backpack, to go out, even just to go out in the backyard. You see, oh, I have uh, one hour of cloudless skies. 
maybe just um, try to get better with it or let's just try to shoot the Pleiades, the Andromeda Galaxy for a bit with my um, DSLM. And it's, um, yeah, it's fun to use, it's something else and I think if you, <laughs> if you show it to other people they would be, um, yeah, surprised uh, at first too, what, what mechanical uh, tracking is actually possible here in terms of engineering. Um, the second point, which fits well to its yeah, purpose, is that it's rather small and um, yeah, that's not, that you don't have too much to carry. I think it's even my third point that it's um, even pretty lightweight. Um, so the small thing first, I just can throw it, just can throw it into my camera backpack here. So um, here on the side, I have this here. I have the polar scope on this back and the camera in here and then the tripod at the bottom and this is all I need for a quick star session. Uh, as you could see, I even went uh, there with my little scooter somewhere on the hills <laughs> in the dark and just had this backpack here. Of course some other camera equipment for, for recording but um, it's just for the star shooting. It's really tiny not much weight and I would say it's a nice thing to have even if you're traveling by plane so that's a um, big advantage um, the third no uh, the next one um, would be that um, even if you think oh yeah maybe I can image for like one hour uh, one minute with it hmm. yeah I don't know but actually as I've de demonstrated you can image <laughs> up to four minutes and I don't think the problem here was the tracker itself, but rather um, the lens or the polar alignment. So if you do a precise polar alignment, this tracker actually is quite capable. You have to be aware of what you put on it. You can't expect like the GT71 here in the back um, to be mounted on that. That's not, not, not something uh, you should do. But uh, cameras and lenses, I'd definitely say yes. Then uh, another thing in the base version, so without the ball head and without a um, wedge, which I still don't have, um, this is rather cheap if you compare it to the iOptron and the Skywatcher um, mobile trackers. I think they are around 400 something euros if I'm not mistaken. And this one, I think it starts at 220. So in the base version it's around half of the price. Yeah, I, I'm aware the um, other full trackers, um, I think their performance should be better and I think um, they have a bit more options and more carrying capacity. But on the other side, <laughs> you have to carry the <laughs> bigger, bigger part with you and also the counterweight. And then again, you just have this little thing um, which you can put even in your backpack when you're hiking. Um, <clears throat> now enough of the playing around with it. <laughs> yes, I said it already, it's uh, lightweight um, and what I actually like about it, it's uh, pretty cleverly engineered too. Um, and my last point here, of course, due to its design and engineering, you don't require any power. You don't need to carry a battery with you and just have this one, your muscle power <laughs> to do, to <laughs> do this. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but you don't require any um, electrical power additionally, you just have the power of your, um, you just have the battery of your camera, which will be the limiting factor and probably the conditions. Uh, other than that, you can just turn, turn and turn again and image um, for a longer time period. Okay, let's draw the line and wrap things up with a conclusion. Is this tracker a piece you should consider purchasing? As for everything, there is never a black and white answer. If you set your expectations and use cases properly, I think this can be a neat tracker in your astrophotography equipment bag. Especially if you plan on doing landscape astro, want something small to have with you in your camera bag during hiking sessions, 
this is a nice addition. Just don't expect to put a big scope on it and even photograph with it too. My recommendation for where I draw the line would be somewhere between APS-C and full frame cameras. It is definitely possible to use full frame on there, but you should take the weight of lenses and additional equipment into account too. Especially for older DSLR lenses that are heavy. I'm looking at you, older Sigma lenses. These things are heavy. <laughs> on the topic of full frame, it's definitely possible to use full frame lenses and I did so too during my La Palma trip. I think the highest magnification I went with my zoom lens was about 80 millimeters, but something like a 200 millimeters lens could be still possible, but you need to um, have it properly balanced and also, it should not be in a disadvantageous spot in the sky, your target. You should, it should be in a um, position where the tracker performs well. If the smallest and the lightest of the bunch is nothing for you, maybe have a look at the other end of the scale. In this video, you can see my first light impressions of the Ioptron CM70, which can carry up to 35 kilograms of payload. So it's a different, <laughs> uh, so it's only another level.